The ancient Greeks used to say that between the time of the Trojan War and the Peloponnesian War, there was only one occasion when all Greeks came together to fight a bloody war involving all of the Greek world, and that was the Lelantine War. So, the Lelantine War, probably happening in 725 BC. That's what we're going to talk about today. So why is this important? Well, it seems to be an epic conflict between neighboring city-states Chalcis and Eritrea on the island of Euboea, that you can see marked in red on the map. Uh, before the Lelantine War, this island was the most important part of Greece. And after the war, it was not. The Eubeans founded many colonies before the war, including the very first colony that we talked about, Almina. Uh, Ischia is another example. But after the war, Eubea is a backwater and it remains a backwater still today. This war enables states like the states you know about, the states you've heard about. Sparta, Athens, Corinth, etc. to become the most important city-states of Greece. So if you want to find a place where the Dark Age really ends and the age of Arche Archaic Greece begins, this is the last opportunity because soon we will have, we already have writing, we have um, Sparta, etc. but soon we will have hoplites and stuff. Uh, so, um, yeah, this is the last time you can say that the Dark Age ended. So this is the island of Euboea, Chalcis and Eritrea located very close to each other, perhaps even closer in the time we are about to talk about. Uh, the people of Euboea were Ionians, they were never conquered by the Dorians during the Dorian conquest. They were related to the people of Attica and thus to the people of Athens. Uh, the major city-states were Chalcis and Old Eritrea. This is the second biggest island in the GNC after Crete. But everything that happens here in the Lelantine War happens on the Lelantine Plain, which is a rather small area between the cities of Chalcis and Eritrea. So look at this. This in yellow is the plain. Before we uh, dive into the details of this epic war, we have to talk about when it really happened. Remember, the Greeks had no written history before Herodotus, and they do not uh, make these Mesopotamian-style monuments where great lords will tell you of their achievements. So the dating is problematic, really, and you will see why when we look at the sources. But we know that the colony of Pithecuse in uh, Italy was founded by Chalcis and Eritrea in the mid 8th century. So the war must have happened uh, later than that. I have chosen to go by the date of the archaeological destruction of Lefkandi. If you look at the map, there is a small village, a town, something called Lefkandi, right between the cities. And I am going to make the argument that this was the main site of Eritrea at the time of the war. But it seems likely that the war happened somewhat later than 725 BC. So our sources are really bad. There are no contemporary detailed historical records. Uh, Tacitus, that I quoted at the very start of the show in the text there, you have to pause the beginning to see it. He is uh, uh, an historian of the Peloponnesian War. But he mentions the Lelantine War. There are other 5th century BC sources that vaguely and briefly mentions this epic war. Uh, there are contemporary poets, Hesiod and Achilochus. Achilochus is so and so contemporary. They reference this war. Herodotus himself talked about the war, Plutarch does, and a lot of other people we will come back to. So look at these contemporary sources. This is what we have. This is all we have from them. Hesiod says, Then I crossed over to Chalcis, to the games of wise Amphidamas, where the sons of the great-hearted hero proclaimed and appointed prizes. So he went to Chalcis, and someone named Amphidamas were dead and had burial games. 
Archilochus says, not many bows will be drawn, nor will slingshots be common whenever battle will be joined in the plain. Instead, the much shine work will belong to the swords, for the warlike lords of Eubea are experienced in that manner of war. Remember, we don't have hoplites yet. We'll come back to this quote. So archaeology, uh, there still remains work to be done, I think. Uh, the first warrior burials at the site of Eritrea are from 710 to 705 BC. That's very specific. Uh, the last such warrior burial is in 690. So some people argue that that should be the time of the war. The Chalcis is still occupied and has not been excavated. Lefkandi is, uh, suffers heavy destruction in 725 BC and is pretty much abandoned for a while there. It is thus likely that Old Eritrea, which is a term that is later used for another place, very confusing, uh, is Lefkandi. And when this war happens, the Eritreans are in Lefkandi, mainly. The other site is occupied, but it's not as big. So the Lelantine War is an armed conflict between Chalcis and Eritrea, and the prize is the Lelantine Plain. And I was looking so much into getting into this epic war. I had a lot of fun with the first Mycenaean war. And now there was another epic, much bigger Greek war I expected. But then I was so disappointed because we really don't know a lot about this war. And it is even likely that it only involved a couple of local city-states and was not at all a conflict involving the whole Greek world. So there has been an interpretation that this war happened between two enormous trade leagues where everybody had to choose side in the Greek world. But I think that might be anachronistic. That might be reflecting 5th century values, 5th century BC values into the 8th century BC world. But we have some clues that allies were involved. So if we look at the side of the Chalcidians, we find that Hesiod says that Amphidamas was the king of Chalcis and that he died in the war. Everybody latches onto this, so Amphidamas appears as the leading character in this war in later stories. So some sources say that Hesiod, Hesiod is the great writer of work and days, one of the most important early Greek writers. I talked about him in the Greek writing episode. I will talk more about him in the 7th century, where we will also talk about Homer, of course. You know about Homer, the Odyssey, the Iliad, etc. And there was one, there is one implication that they actually competed in a poetry competition or something in these funeral, funeral games for Amphidamas. Aristotle says that uh, Chalcis was ruled by the aristocratic uh, Hippobutai family and that there was no king at all, so he doesn't acknowledge Amphidamas as a real person. And Plutarch has Amphidamas die in a sea fight, but there are signs that none of this fighting happened at sea because despite the fact that these cities had huge navies, remember they had been sea powers for a long time, we don't know the names of any specific person in Eritrea. So, the allies then, um, on the side of Eritrea Lefkandi, we find Megara, Miletus, Achaeus, Messenia, and Argos. Argos is here because Sparta is on the other side. Argos and Sparta do not like each other. Athens is notably missing, and they look like they should be on this side, but they are not. So they seem to be neutral. On the Chalcis side, you find more substantial allies. Uh, the mighty city of Corinth about to break out, the oracle at Delphi, and it is possible that the oracle support for the Chalcidian side in the Lelantine War is what made the oracle the number one thing among oracles in Greek. We, I talked a little bit about that in the oracle at Delphi episode, so check that out. But, but it, it is believed that this choice of the oracle to go with the Chalcidians really mattered for the success of the oracle. And Sparta is here, Sparta is on the side of, uh, on the side of Chalcis, but uh, my timeline here has them really occupied with the first Mycenaean war. So, and we have no mention of valiant Spartans doing stuff in this war. So I doubt that. But one Chalcidian ally mattered more than others. It was Cleomachus, and we'll talk more about him. 
So they had their impressive na navies, but the war was fought on land. And just like the Messenian War, this is a protracted series of operations and not one giant battle. And the war seems to have been going on for a long time and it really weakened both cities. And maybe that was what forced them to bring in allies from other city-states. Um, we don't know much about what happened in the war, but we know the conduct of the war. This is pre-Hoplite, as I said three times now, I think. Chalcis had strong infantry and Eritrea had strong cavalry. And there uh, Strabo, the historian, uh, mentions a stele recording an agreement. This is at the temple of Artemis Amorysia. This is in Eritrean territory. And this stele has an agreement that says that no long range weapons may be used in the war. So you were banned from using bows and slingshots. And this was what Antilochus said in the quote at the beginning of this show as well, that the sword must decide this. And at some point Amphidamas, possibly the king of Chalcis, dies. And the Chalcidians are hard pressed by the Eritrean cavalry, because on the plane it's better to have cavalry than pre-hoplite infantry. And then comes Cleomachus, woohoo, the hero of the story. Cleomachus comes from Pharsalus, he arrives with the famous Thessalian cavalry. This is, uh, yeah, right over the, from the mainland. So these could have been Pharsalians fighting in Thessalian style or actual Thessalians. And they take the side of Chalcis, they are effective against the Eritrean cavalry. Cleomachus dies, probably in an epic fight, and is buried under great honors in the Agora itself of Chalcis. So how did the war end? Well, nobody really knows. We don't know when it ended. This is extremely unsatisfying, but it is ancient history we do deal with here. And it's ancient history where there are no Mesopotamian braggarts. So I, it's much easier to talk about the Assyrian wars, but at least someone makes a claim of knowing what happened. Sports break! We have the uh, 14th Olympiad happening in 724 BC. The Diolus race was added. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but I wanted to keep up with the Olympic news here. Uh, the aftermath of the war then. Chalcis remained an important sea power and it established several colonies after the war, as did Eritrea. And the site of New Eritrea, which is Eritrea on this map, then seems to have enjoyed some prosperity. Lefkandi was totally abandoned, probably too exposed to Chalcidian aggression. Uh, but um, Eritrea was evicted from the colony of Pithecusa that it had founded jointly with Chalcis. And Corinth, then an ally of Chalcis, went into Corsaira in 735 and took the colony from Eritrea. This is like the short term of the moth, but in the long time of the war, of the <laughs> in the long time of the moth, we know that uh, Eubea loses loses a lot of its importance. Uh, there is a guy called Theognis who writes in the sixth century BC: "The wine-rich plain of Lelanton is being shorn bare," but we don't know who was sharing it and why. The one thing we know that Eubean history is now lost to us. Most of it is lost to us, and the island leaves the central stage of Greek history in a very remarkable way. So I found this quote in Cambridge Ancient History, which I would like to read to you. Greece owed the great cultural and economic debt to the two Euboean cities of the geometric period, to their initiative in trade overseas, to their leading colonizing. For such early years, the evidence of ancient authors is inevitably patchy or silent, but this is an area in which the spade has already served the historian well and promises more. Well, I hope we will get to know more about this conflict. But the main effect, the thing to remember is that the Euboean power base is gone. And when we talk about Greek colonies after that, we will very rarely talk about Euboea. And this, of course, affects the Euboean colony of Almina that we mentioned back in 825 BC. Um, all the Euboean interest in the colony disappears after about 700 and we have no idea why. And it seems that the East Greek states, that's the states, uh, the Greek states of Anatolia, 
uh, of uh, Asia Minor, they take over the commercial interest in Almina. Remember, Almina wasn't a proper colony, it was a trading base where the Eubians had imported uh, Syrian stuff. Okay, more sports news because we have the nude Olympiad in 720 BC. We have to talk about this. This is the 15th Olympiad. There is another new event added, Dolikos, long distance running. And it is won by Akantos from Sparta. He's the first known Spartan winner of the Olympic Games. And the Spartans are super successful in the early Olympic Games. There are 81 known winners between 720 and 576 BC. 46 are Spartans. The short distance race, 21 of 36 winners. Spartans! Because the Spartans valued physical fitness over everything. And they were efficient trainers. And they are, by some sources, credited with nudity in the Olympics. And it is supposed to have happened at this Olympic. But this, there is a conflicting story of why the competitors went nude. Because they had not been nude in the first 14th Olympiads. The Spartans also invented uh, covering oneself in oil, which is great for running, uh, apparently. Of course, there was another event, the stadium race. It was won by Orsippos of Megara. And there is a story that he dropped his loincloth when running and then he became nude. And people blamed him for dropping the loincloth uh, willfully because apparently it's an advantage to run nude. And if you are a runner, I want you to explain this to me. It seems uh, very uncomfortable to run nude. Uh, yeah, I won't elaborate on that, but it seems strange to me. Next time, we are going to go into the 710s BC. And the 710s BC is stacked with action. We have the true king himself, Sargon II of Assyria. And he has to secure his power in Assyria after his successful coup d'etat. And somewhere on the edge of the known world, Umen Manda, the horde from God knows where, as Dan Carlin so fittingly put it, are about to make their move. And we are about to see the first major barbarian invasion from the steppes of Russia. Yep, I'm going to continue these decade reports until 701 BC when we are going to talk about the destruction of Sennacherib. Uh, if I get enough support and funding from somewhere, maybe from you at patreon.com slash fan of history, I will go into the 7th century BC. Uh, there is a lot of amazing things that happens in the 7th century BC, so please consider contributing like a couple of cents or a dollar to Fan of History on patreon.com slash Fan of History. If you can hit $30, we will do the 7th century. That includes the total destruction of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. It includes an even bigger barbarian invasion. It includes the Neo-Babylonian Empire, the Median Empire. There's just so much awesome stuff going on in the 7th century BC. It also involves the Assyrian conquest of Egypt. When foreign enemies stand on Egyptian soil for the first time in a very long time. So I hope you come with me. And if you don't want to contribute on Patreon, please share and like and subscribe. Check out the Fan of History podcast on iTunes. And thank you for watching.